Ready? Okay, ready, get set, go. Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome um, to the 2 o'clock um, Oceans Day session. Um, we're here to talk um, about ocean observations um, and the importance of measuring the ocean. Um, and uh, from, from various points of view, things that are changing the ocean um, and um, why are we here? Um, why are observations important? Um, in the Dubai Ocean Declaration, which I hope um, many of you have read already, or if you haven't, um, look it up. Uh, there, there are a lot of statements, but this is an important one, that human activity, particularly in the form of greenhouse gas emissions, that adversely impact the heat content, sea level, and acidity of the ocean, interferes with the ocean's ability to support marine and terrestrial life, and hinders sustainable development worldwide. That's why we're here. And uh, the main big statement is you can't manage it if you don't measure it. Um, so, um, and that's basically um, what Margaret Linen's um, take on the Dubai Ocean Declaration is. So welcome to our session. Um, we have six panelists. Uh, can, oh, hey, there he is. Hey, virtual is working. And you can hear us. Yay. <laughs> okay, so um, me, I'm Lynn Talley. I'm at Scripps. I'm a professor of oceanography. Uh, Dr. Michael Morgan, who's an Assistant Sec Secretary of Commerce um, from NOAA. Um, uh, Karina von Schuchman from Merc Mercator. How do I say it properly? Mercator. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Mitchell Chandler, who's a PhD student at Scripps. Uh, Ken Johnson, uh, who's at Mbari, um, and he's appearing virtually from home at 2 a.m. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, and Kate Lane, uh, who's a PhD student from MIT Hui. So, um, unlike a lot of the other panels, we actually have a presentation with quite a few slides. We want to inform you about the observations and then inform you about uh, some of the basic big changes that have been documented with these observations. Um, and so our program today is um, opening remarks from Dr. Morgan. Um, and uh, then we'll have a, a series of slides on um, observing systems for the deep ocean, global and deep ocean and then a series of slides on the phenomena that we've been observing with these. So, um, and at the end, uh, hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my, name is Dr. Uh, my name is Michael Morgan, and I serve as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction for the United States uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, through today's panel, we hope to have an engaging conversation on the importance of ocean observing for climate action. And so there are two themes in the brief remarks that I have uh, this afternoon. One is focus on NOAA and U.S. leadership of the One Argo and GoShip uh, programs, but also the importance of One Argo, GoShip, and ocean data in general for understanding and addressing climate change. The U.S. Argo program and GoShip are hallmarks of NOAA's ocean observing systems and show our commitment to long-term operational funding for ocean monitoring. This includes opportunistic funding for recent infrastructure to help supplement the declining array. The U.S. Argo program is not only the global leader, but we also play an important role to ensure that Argo is truly global. The Southern Hemisphere is a challenge to deploy floats and the U.S. has made important partnerships with New Zealand to deploy over 100 floats annually in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Without the U.S. program, there would not be a global Argo program. Similarly, GoShip remains the best platform for achieving high quality, high spatial resolution, space over the globe and, vertical, um, and in the vertical data that can tell us how the ocean storage of heat and carbon are changing due to natural and human caused changes. Improving and increasing ocean data and information underpins two of NOAA's core priorities building a climate-ready nation, and supporting a sustainable blue economy. Furthermore, ship-based surveys like, like GoShip and autonomous platforms like Argo, along with shallower uh, coastal observations, work together to build a robust and resilient ocean observing network. The United States intends to continue its support to the global ocean observing system, including the Argo program, along with the development of enhanced and new technologies in ocean observing systems. For an example, Funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or the BIL, is enabling NOAA to deploy small pilot arrays for deep and BGC Argo missions. If fully implemented, these arrays would provide an incredible expansion 
of ocean information. These pilot deplo uh, deployments will provide a window into this incredible potential. We are deploying them in critical U.S. fishery and coastal and coral reef eco ecosystem regions and exploring the ability of BGC Argo to inform fisheries management, ocean acidification adaptation and mitigation activities, marine carbon dioxide removal research, and foundational monitoring of ocean changes. This bipartisan infrastructure law funding is temporary and represents a relatively small percentage of what is truly needed to establish and maintain one Argo. Achieving full implementation requires increased commitment and ambition from all Argo partners, and we must continue to remind the international community about the need for ocean data to support climate action. NOAA is excited to support this expanded one Argo and similar efforts, and we invite other nations to join us. Ocean observations are critical in predicting and forecasting extreme weather events, understanding how climate change is affecting society and the planet, and building a sustainable blue economy. GOSHIP is an internationally coordinated network of 55 global sustained hydrographic sections covering the ocean basins from coast to coast and full depth. U.S. GOSHIP, funded by NOAA and the National Science Foundation, supports approximately half of the GOSHIP sections. International collaborations make GOSHIP the backbone of high accuracy seafloor to surface ocean measurements. The 17 member nations of International GOSHIP provide sustained inventories of ocean carbon, heat, freshwater, oxygen, nutrients, and tra transient tracers on a global scale at the highest required accuracy to detect multi decadal ocean changes. In addition to collecting water samples, GOSHIP serves as a critical platform for testing, launching, calibrating, and validating ocean observing strategies, including Argo floats. Continued international partnerships and funding are critical for sustaining this keystone ocean observing platform. NOAA continues to view the International Argo program as critical to climate and weather forecasting, understanding how climate change is affecting society and the planet, and building a sustainable blue economy. It is a critical component of the global ocean observing system. We should also recognize that the success of the Argo program would not be possible without the international contributions of 26 countries. International collaboration is the core of what makes the Argo program a success. With the new missions comprising the One Argo Array, major gaps in our climate observing system will be filled. By reaching into the deep and into the polar seas, the Earth's energy imbalance will be fully captured. With a full depth ocean heat known, we will finally close the sea level budget and be able to more accurately forecast sea level rise in the future. Ocean carbon uptake will uh, be directly measured rather than inferred. Ocean environment and ecosystem tracking and prediction will allow global fisheries to make better management decisions in the face of warming, ocean deoxygenation, deoxygenation and acidification. As NOAA, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is providing more uh, some feeds of seed funding for implementing some aspects of One Argo, including the further development of capabilities that would allow Argo flows to safely and successfully collect and transmit data in the Arctic year round. As we progress into this next phase of ocean observing, there is a renewed need for new partnership and increased resource management investment. This also includes adv advancements to help implement and maintain the expansion of the One Argo program. The International Argo program has been a primary provider of subsurface ocean data down to 2,000 meters for the last 20 years. In addition, uh, GOSHIP and its previous iterations have provided seafloor to surface measurements since 1970. This is because the international community has committed long-term operational resources in developing a sustained, reliable, and accessible ocean observing system. So my hope is today that we have a great conversation on the importance of ocean data with understanding and addressing climate change. NOAA, through building international partnerships like Argo and GOSHIP, aims to provide and support high quality global ocean observations and research to improve our scientific understanding and inform society about the ocean's role in environmental change. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've actually covered everything we're going to say, which is wonderful. <laughs> we'll just illustrate it now. <laughs> but that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so um, here's basically the outline of what we'll be going through. Um, first, a section that I'll, I'll uh, show some slides on uh, the actual observing systems, the um, Argo, One Argo, and the Ghost Ship Observing System. I have brought along a little 
demo since we couldn't bring an actual Argo float, but this is a little guy, and I will advertise ahead of time that you can pick up your own Argo Lego <laughs> <laughs> or a kit with instructions for building one <laughs> afterwards. Um, so I thought it would just be interesting to see, you know, basically what they're like. This isn't quite full size, but it's almost. That's basically what we're talking about. Um, so, and then we'll talk about um, uh, ocean changes, um, impacts, and each of our panelists will be um, going through um, a set of, of uh, different information there. So I'm going to start with the sustained ocean observations for climate change. Um, basically, as, as Dr. Morgan has already said, our, truly our only way of measuring the global ocean, top to bottom, um, talking about the abyssal ocean as, as opposed to the coastal oceans, is with these two um, these two observing systems, the Argo and the Ghost Ship, and they are synergistic. Um, our, our basically, you see over there, there's a ship, there's a float that has just dropped off. Um, why do we need an observing system for the global ocean? Because uh, we'll say, if you don't observe it, you don't know what happened. Um, and secondly, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and a very important topic at this meeting has been marine carbon dioxide removal, and so I think it's critical that we have an observing system in place as we begin to contemplate that. Um, and therefore, we wouldn't be able, if we didn't measure, we wouldn't be able to predict uh, what's happening. We wouldn't be able to improve our models. Um, so um, what are these two systems? On the left is a piece of a global map. Um, Argo and Ghost Ship are part of something called the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE. Um, you can look that up. Um, it has uh, a lot of international committees. Uh, that as part of that framework for GOOSE, Global Ocean Observing System, there are essential ocean variables, what needs to be measured, how to measure it, where to measure it, how well to measure it. Um, in the middle, uh, the Ghost Ship Repeat Survey. Ghost Ship may not mean much, too much to you, but it's ship-based measurements. Uh, we go out and repeat um, every five to 10 years. And on the right is someone putting um, an Argo float, like this one, in the water, only not cardboard. <laughs> um, and this is just a, a sort of a nice schematic of, of how these systems work together. Um, above it all, there are satellites looking at the whole um, ocean, and then we have a ship steaming along, uh, taking incredibly high, high, a highly accurate measurements, and ship and other ships dropping floats in that then drift off wherever they're drifting, and they they profile up and down. So, and they can go under ice, and they can go pretty much wherever the currents take them, long after the ship was there. Um, go ship. Um, here's a ship. This is um, in it, down in the ice. Most of the ocean doesn't have ice. There's the network of the uh, repeated sections over there in the map. Um, uh, this is an international program, very much international program. The U U.S. is a very big contributor to it, but it's very international. Um, and um, these sections on these ships are expensive and slow, and they happen every five to ten years. And that's to, um, that timing is basically set to really get a change in carbon inventory in the ocean over that, that's detectable. Um, and there's another slide. Um, if you look at this later, you can get the list of all of the, uh, the instruments and everything that, we, the, everything that we need to measure, the sensors that we take. And that's all laid out by agreement over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so that's the hydrographic work, hydrographic surveys, repeat hydrography. Um, this is the um, one Argo system that Dr. Morgan mentioned. Uh, this is a new branding, uh, calling it one Argo. What's been in place for 20 years has been uh, measuring temperature and salinity from the surface to 2,000 meters every 10 days. Uh, the global array is about 4,000 floats. That's called core Argo now. That's the core of what's done. Um, every Argo float out there has temperature and salinity on it. Um, the two Expansions, big expansions, are to go from 2,000 meters to the bottom, um, also measuring temperature and salinity. That's this little deep Argo over here. So if we had, had one of the little deep Argos here, it would be about this big, about this big around. Um, so it's kind of like a, yeah, it's basically like a big globe. Um, those go to the bottom of the ocean. And on the right, we have um, what we call biogeochemical Argo, big, long name. This is a biogeochemical Argo float. It has a little forest of sensors on top and an extra one down below to measure um, the chemistry and um, biology um, uh, things. Uh, why, are the, why are these good? Um, ships 
uh, first of all, are slow and um, expensive. And who wants to go? Well, you can't go to the ice-covered Antarctica in the winter. Who would want to do it anyway? It's unsafe. Um, but with Argo, you're measuring the full ocean every 10 days, year-round, getting full seasonal cycles, um, an incredible amount of detail. Um, so here is the current um, Argo um, array on the right. There are currently 3,800 floats out there. Every dot is, a, is an active float of last week. Um, and it's been going on since 2004. The target is about 4,000 floats. That's kind of a number to keep in mind towards the end. Um, as was mentioned um, by Dr. Morgan, there's a bit, been a bit of a slippage in the, in the numbers of floats. Um, and this is something that is extremely important for us to bring, sort of bring forward and say that we, what we need are sustained observations, which means continuing um, at full force. This is the uh, developing deep Argo system. Uh, you see dots scattered around the map now um, with the ghost ship lines underneath. Um, it's what we'd call an emerging system. It's currently at about 200 floats and it's, it's building. Um, it is also every 10 days surface to bottom, measuring temperature and salinity. And uh, a number of the floats actually also have oxygen. And then the biogeochemical um, Argo, BGC Argo, um, is currently at about 300 floats and it's building. Uh, the US effort is uh, largely funded as an experiment. It's, a, it's an experimental build. Uh, through NSF, uh, polar programs, and um, on the infrastructure side of NSF. Um, and there is a, an important component from NOAA um, with uh, building arrays um, off the U.S. coast and in the Gulf of Mexico, and then operating the data management system. Um, I just will mention what is measured with BGC Argo. Um, it's the temperature and salinity, but we've also added on to it oxygen, nitrate, pH. Um, chlorophyll, backscatter, and irradiance. So if those mean anything to you, that's what these floats can measure. Um, if that doesn't mean anything, yeah, okay. Well, you might have heard of deoxygenation or acidification or that the ocean takes up a bunch of carbon. This is how you can measure it. So, um, so now that's the observing system, and now we'll talk about what the observing system has been measuring for the last 20 years. So uh, uh, Karina von Schuckman will take the next slides. Yes, you come up. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this um, great overview in terms of uh, the evolution of the Argo system. And I would like to start with one specific measure Argo has allowed, has revolutionized through its measurements uh, of the deep ocean on subsurface temperature, and that is the ocean warming. So what do we know that the ocean is warming? Uh, from, from the fact that the ocean is warming. We know that there are a lot of various interference with the bio biogeochemistry of the ocean and also with the biodiversity of the ocean with adverse impacts for marine ecosystems. But we also know something else because the ocean is warming. We know that the Earth is out of energy balance. And uh, this energy balance is existing because of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this leads to an accumulation of heat in a climate system, and the majority, about 90% of this accumulated heat is uh, taken up by the ocean, a unique service from the ocean for us in terms of natural mitigation. So um, Argo has allowed for the first time, because the Earth's energy imbalance was an empirical discovery from uh, a group around using the NASA GIS model, and uh, with Argo in 2010, and so we have started to look at uh, the evolution of ocean warming from 2005 onwards. That is when Argo has reached about 70% of its initial measurement target, uh, which had allowed to provide a first time an estimate to um, uh, confirm the empirical estimate of the Earth's energy imbalance. So uh, the ocean um, the measurement of Argo in terms of, and also the other components of the Global Ocean Observing System providing uh, temperature measurements, uh, allows us also to see where the heat in the ocean uh, is distributed, where the ocean is warming, where the ocean is warming stronger than in other areas. 
and uh, provide us a 3D view from the surface down to 2,000 meter depths. And with the ev evolution of the deeper ocean layers uh, and the deep ARCO component, we will have a further information in the future. This regional information has also another very important um, application that is with the uh, um, knowledge of uh, deep uh, measurements revolutionized through Argo and other, uh, including with other oce uh, global ocean observing system components, not only for temperature, but also for salinity, biogeochemistry variables, etc. cetera. Um, we have also a revolution in terms of improvements for operational systems. And these improvements are critical important in evolution for operational systems uh, with the, uh, which are taking up the data in order to combine with our theoretical no knowledge on the modeling allows us to further advance and build up a uh, monitoring service, not only monitoring, but also dedicated and targeted support for adaptation measures, much needed, but also to construct um, early warning systems uh, for uh, the increased frequency of extremes, nature queens to come. Thank you very much. All right. So the next aspect, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is sea level rise. And so we can measure sea level rise using uh, tide gauges, which give us measurements at only a single location and by using satellites, which give us global measurements of the ocean surface. And using these satellite measurements, we've observed that sea level has risen by over 100 millimeters since 1993, which is a rate of approximately 3.4 millimeters per year. And unfortunately, sea level rise is certain to continue with projections indicating a likely increase of between 30 to 100 centimeters by the end of the, de uh, the century. Sorry. But because of the slow response of sea level rise to greenhouse gas emissions, the sea level rise is predicted to continue even beyond 2100, um, even if we do manage to stop greenhouse gas emissions by that time. And so sea level rise occurs through two main processes. The first of these is through ocean mass changes, which is simply the addition of water from land into the ocean. And this mainly occurs through melting of ice sheets and melting of glaciers. And over the past uh, few decades, ocean mass changes have been the main contributor to the sea level rise that we've observed. But the other main process is steric expansion, which is simply the thermal expansion of seawater as the ocean takes up heat and warms. And so, as I mentioned, satellites can tell us the total sea level rise, but in order to know the contributions from these components, we need to know what's happening within the ocean, not just at the surface. And so since 2005, measurements from Argo floats have shown us that in the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean, steric expansion has contributed about one third of the sea level rise that has occurred in that time frame. But we know that the ocean is also warming below 2,000 meters. And this deep ocean warming also causes steric expansion and therefore also contributes to sea level rise. However, our measurements of the deep ocean have been relatively limited, with almost all deep ocean measurements coming from the ghost ship surveys that you've heard about. So approximately every 10 years, we have measurements of the deep ocean. As a result of this, the uncertainty in the contribution of deep ocean steric expansion to sea level rise is relatively large. Although current estimates suggest that Currently, the deep ocean only contributes about 10% of what the upper ocean does. But with the recent development and deployment of the deep Argo floats that you've heard about, uh, this these deep Argo floats measure from the sea surface all the way to the sea floor. So this will allow us to measure the deep ocean and therefore reduce the uncertainty in this deep ocean contribution term. So currently, Deep Argo is uh, in its pilot phase. So as you saw on an earlier slide, there's measurements being made at just a few locations around the world. 
but the eventual aim is to have a global array of deep Argo floats measuring between the sea surface and the sea floor. And this deep Argo array will complement the existing array of Argo floats in the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean. And so with ocean warming expected to increase, and in particular deep ocean warming expected to increase, we need this global and full depth Argo array in order to reduce uncertainties in our, our sea level budget and eventually close it, as Dr. Morgan mentioned, but also to better project uh, global increases in sea level rise, but also regional changes. And this um, global and full depth deep Argo array is only possible with increased and sustained support from the international community. Thank you. Um, so the next slides, a set of slides, um, uh, Ken Johnson from uh, Monterey, uh, MBARI, will uh, guide us through the carbon budget and oxygen and so forth. Um, let's see if we can hear you. Um, yeah, can we? Uh, <clears throat> I, am I good? I am, uh, Lynn, am yeah, I, are you me. hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you. Just tell me when to advance. Okay, okay. well, let's stay on the first slide right now. And, and so um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak and, and good afternoon, everyone. So Karina, Karina spoke to the services that the um, ocean provides to us in terms of taking up heat. The ocean provides other services, one of which is taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So uh, the um, the Go Ship program, the the uh, uh, really extremely high quality measurements repeated uh, at sort of a decadal time scale, show uh, uh, reveal to us the amount of carbon dioxide that the ocean has absorbed at a decadal time scale. This is the ocean is taking up about thirty percent of the excess carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. Uh, but next slide, Lynn. We're concerned that possibly the uh, the uh, service that the ocean provides as it warms may change, um, and the air sea flux uh, of carbon dioxide has the potential to uh, decrease in time. And so this slide shows four panels. Um, the uh, uh, top left is is uh, the mapped flux of carbon dioxide uh, across the air sea interface based on uh, an extensive set of shipboard measurements encompassed in a program called SOCAT, Surface Ocean CO2 Atlas, uh, ship-based measurements that um, uh, are taken and then uh, uh, mapped with the neural network. On this, on this top left plot and all of these plots, blue shows the flow of carbon dioxide into the ocean, red is flow out. Um, the panel below um, on the left shows uh, same kind of a view, but the ship-based data augmented with the Argo floats. And one of the messages here is that both ships and Argo system can operate in a synergy that really improves our understanding of the ocean. The one example of that is then to look at the upper right uh, or, or right-hand panels. Uh, the upper right shows our view of the ship-based flow of carbon dioxide with now red in the winter, um, uh, showing CO2 uh, coming out of the ocean in the winter. But the key to take home here, as Lynn mentioned, is there's very few measurements in the Southern Ocean in the winter. It's just very difficult to work down there um, from a ship. Uh, the Argo floats um, in winter, it, appears add additional information on this summer the floats where there's a lot of ship data the floats uh are you know you can barely tell a difference in the two left hand panels but on the right it's very clear that the floats are now adding additional information uh simply because there's very little ship based data in the winter uh that red in the lower right panel shows where carbon dioxide is now coming out of the ocean at rates higher than we expected so the synergy between uh, the ships, the observing ship system with ships and with floats is essential. And I wanna stress, this is not an either or situation, but it's really the synergy between ships 
um, and floats. The floats also provide us a view uh, every 10 days into the interior of the ocean, um, not just at the surface, that allows us to understand why the carbon dioxide flux might be changing. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, uh, uh, another view uh, of a service that the ocean provides. So in the upper panel, uh, the dark line at the top shows CO2 in the atmosphere increasing. Um, these are measurements at the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Station uh, in, in the water at the Mauna Loa um, Observatory uh, in, in the atmosphere. In the top panel, then the, the squiggly line going up and down is the ocean uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentration going it, it, it just in hand in hand, going up hand in hand with the atmosphere. As the ocean absorbs that CO2, though, uh, that lowers the ocean pH, and that's what we see in the lower uh, panel there. Its pH is going down. There's concern that as ocean pH goes down, the ability of organisms to make calcium carbonate shells, for example, will change, and it's possible that there will be ecosystem shifts in the ocean. One of the, um, so we have uh, a few very exquisite uh, ship-based time series, as you see at Hawaii, but only a few of them. And the desire is to map this into uh, a very high spatial resolution. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see this, the, one of the uh, Argo, BGC Argo profiling float pro programs, SOCOM, um, has mapped the Southern Ocean with several hundred profiling floats in the Southern Ocean, taking the, sh the profiling float pH data, merging it with an ocean a data assimilating model to show the variability in ocean acidification rates. So the color scale here, blue, is a pH going down in the ocean, as we um, expect from rising atmospheric CO2. But you see in the upper plot that the, there's quite large variability in where the pH in the ocean is changing. The floats give us the opportunity to not just look at the surface of the ocean, but also, again, down deep into the interior. The lower panel shows the change in pH in the ocean at 700 meters. And you actually see areas where uh, there's red, where pH is going up in the ocean due to changes in ocean circulation, as well as the acidification from the ocean absorbing carbon dioxide. Um, we need this kind of information. As Lynn said, you can't manage what you can't measure. We need to understand how, how signals uh, like the P changing pH of the ocean will drive uh, ecosystem changes into the future. And if we could have the next slide, um, the uh, would show the um, oxygen in the ocean at uh, uh, 200 meters. Um, this is uh, uh, again the synergy of ship based observing and the profiling floats. So, uh, this is, should be an animation. I hope it's running out. Yeah, okay, um, this is showing the, the time change in, in oxygen in the ocean, um, uh, monthly. And based on both the ship data, which is just repeated every uh, approximately 10 years, and the profiling float data, which is every 10 days, and showing the synergy that we can now um, observe the, the uh, interannual variability in oxygen. You see the um, flow. You see the very dark areas are parts of the ocean uh, at 200 meters depth where there's essentially no oxygen. So the Eastern Tropical Pacific, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal are, are completely uh, oxygen depleted. Uh, concern in a warming climate, this will expand. And so I think that is the last of my slides and Kate might be up next. Is that, I hope that's the last. So it's an honor to speak today about um, the ocean and our need to monitor the ocean. And I'm going to talk about how the ocean is really alive. So um, it's life that we can't see. And, and you can see in the upper right is an illustration of uh, marine phytoplankton. And they're the Amazon rainforest of the ocean. And 50% of the oxygen produced annually on Earth um, comes from the ocean. And it, ocean also pulls 50 gigatons of carbon in the form of CO2 um, from the atmosphere into the ocean annually. And some of this carbon is transported into the deep ocean, 
So it's very important that our ocean remains healthy and alive and that we measure how it's happening. And, but not all productivity is good. Blooms that can also be caused by climate change and human activity um, can be toxic and they can um, impact food supplies as well as produce oxygen minimum zones. Oops, wrong way. Um, so here I want to show you a snapshot of um, ocean net primary production as um, studied by the BGC Argo floats that have been mentioned. So these biogeochemical floats that show these markers of life in the ocean. Uh, and so on the upper right is a map of the chlorophyll, which um, chlorophyll is a pigment of green that uh, phytoplankton and plants use for photosynthesis. And so this is in May 2022, and the green is where there's uh, more uh, chlorophyll. And then on the bottom, these figures show measurements from the Argo floats. And so what's amazing about the Argo floats, unlike the satellite measurements, is that we can see depth. And there's so much variability that happens that the Argo floats can measure. So we can see the daily cycle. This is measured by oxygen um, production on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is time. So on the x, we can see the first panel, we can see the daily oscillation of um, the sun comes out and the phytoplankton start producing oxygen. And on the middle, we can see the seasonal cycle. There's more productivity in the summer and less in the winter. And then on the third, we can really see this um, depth dependence and understanding this whole, um, and in the blue, bright blue is a reflection of, it shows May 2022. So this is that whole snapshot. And then um, I want to talk about some ambu ambiguity that we're now seeing in our ocean as it's changing, um, which is now being called greening. And basically, the surface of the ocean is getting greener. And we can see it through satellite measurements. Um, it's not explained by warmest, warmer sea surface temperatures. And it's also not explained, um, you can see in this figure, the magenta is showing where the ocean is greening. And in the blue hash marks on top um, show where uh, it's also like associated with chlorophyll trends. And so you can see that the greening is not necessarily associated with more, it, it's, we're not really sure, it's not associated with more productivity. So we're not really sure why it's happening. It could be due to greater stratification, changes in nutrients, um, changes in currents, and it really requires further investigation. And this is the type of data that only an Argo float, uh, the BGC Argo float especially, and one Argo could help us understand. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll say my final statement. Um, sea surface measurements of the ocean um, monitor change and improve our projection of organic carbon uptake, oxygen changes, and ecosystem response globally and regionally. Thank you. So we're coming to the end of the slides. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, to sum up basically um, how we're observing climate to ocean climate change. Um, I'm really focused uh, here, well, actually we've got both um, Argo and Go Ship going here. Um, main statement um, here is that these sustained observations of the global deep ocean um, are critical for, um, for documenting, following uh, climate change in the ocean. Um, it's not just a sa satellites are absolutely essential as well. Satellites see one millimeter of the ocean. Uh, what we see with this is everything going on below. So if there's really warm water in, you know, around Florida from the satellites, is it only one millimeter of really warm water? 100 degree Fahrenheit, oops, what is that in C <laughs> Celsius? Um, or is it, is it 20 meters thick? In which case it matters, you know, that's a lot of energy to add, say, to a storm, to a hurricane. Um, if, it, if the winds can, can whip it up and make it cooler, then fine. But if it's a really deep heat content, then there's a lot of energy. Um, so basically, what's been built over the last 20 years in terms of Argo is a phenomenally successful observing system um, to measure the heat content. It also measures the salinity, which we haven't touched on at all. It's very, very important to measure that relative to the changes in rain patterns and evaporation and precipitation of the globe. And those are changing as well. Um, and we just haven't shown that um, here in this talk. Um, what we want to illustrate on the right in the top plot um, is all Argo um, is in green at the top. 
Um, Core Argo, which is TNS down to 2,000 meters, is the second one down. So it's most of the array is Core Argo. You see the original buildup of the array um, in the 2000s, and then it, it started reaching to you know to really pretty much global uh, coverage, and then up to full density. Um, it's been slowly coming down a little bit. Uh, you see that Core Argo is declining even more. But at the bottom, you see BGC Argo and Deep Argo starting to come in. Those also cover the upper 2,000 meters. So every single Argo profile gets the upper 2,000. So part of the way that all, all of Argo, one Argo, um, is sustained at the moment is through the addition of the other two arrays, which are in experimental phase. They're not at the sustained observations state yet. Um, as those grow, um, then core Argo can come down. Um, as long as the total global is about 4,000. Um, so there's been a bit of a drop. Um, uh, so I guess the point of that is that BGC and Deep Argo are basically an emerging, an emerging observing system. They are not yet a sustained observing system, but we think there are many good reasons for sustaining them. Um, at the bottom, behind Mitchell's head, <laughs> is um, all at time across the bottom. And this is all the oxygen profiles collected uh, from ships and from floats. So you'll see two curves down towards the bottom of the, of the plot. Those are all the ship-based oxygen measurements. Oxygen is a measure of, of, as we said, you need oxygen in the water for stuff to live. Um, anything, that, everything that, anything that's breathing needs its oxygen. Um, we measure oxygen, um, and you see the ship-based measurements kind of dropping. Some of them are done with sensors. Some of them are done with bottles, with titrations. And you see over that time, the float-based oxygen profiles have taken off. This is a, a fairly cheap version, ex inexpensive. Cheap is not right. Inexpensive with great instruments. <laughs> um, uh, uh, array um, that is part of biogeochemical Argo. Um, and you see that that has really taken off over um, the last decade or so. Um, we think that that is essential. At least getting that oxygen array out there is, is really important. If it were gone uh, and you see the ships dropping off, then you kind of are running into not measuring the oxygen. That's a take-home message there. So our very final slide, uh, to sum up before we get to some Q&A and discussion, um, is that... Um, Observing the open ocean, uh, we need both one Argo and ghost ship. They are synergistic. Um, one Argo is what, where are we getting the detail? We're getting measurements every 10 days, and that is really, really important. You're getting the seasonal cycle everywhere. Seasonal cycles are also changing with climate change. Um, uh, and there's also natural climate variability on that. So you want to see the seasonal cycle, how it's changing, et cetera. Um, we are using one Argo now um, and hope and the, the, the right now it's critical for the heat content. When you look at an IPCC report or something that shows you the heat content of the ocean, what you're looking at is mostly Argo uh, for the last 20 years. You're seeing the climb, you're seeing the heat going in. Um, what is possible with BGC Argo, with these guys, is to do that for carbon as well and for oxygen as well, to really be able to see the full budget. Um, we combine it with um, data assimilating models. Um, we can fully close budgets um, with enough observations. Um, and so as we build these arrays, we'll be able to really look at where the carbon goes in, um, monitor uptake um, over the decades to come. Um, so, um, and there's a lot, of, a, a lot of discussion in this meeting on MCDR. As I've said at the very beginning, I think it's essential that we have a system in place as we begin to change um, the carbon balances uh, between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, and GOSHIP is our uh, gold standard measurements. This has full, you know, fully staffed labs on the ship out there making measurements to back up to really do the highest standard carbon, oxygen, nutrient budgets. Um, and it uh, has been expanded in the last five years to include bio ghost ship. It's looking at the plankton um, communities as well in much more detail than, say, a float that's just measuring um, chlorophyll and backscatter. So that is it for our presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much for... Yeah. And so um, Mitchell and Kate will lead the Q&A. How do you want to do it?
about 15 minutes, so we're going to throw it to the audience. Um, and if you guys don't have questions, then Kate and I can come up with some for everyone else. But if there's any audience questions, um, raise your hand. Emily will run the mic out to you. Well, okay, I'll kick it off. Um, can you guys comment on how um, how these measurements will impact our ability to forecast weather um, and how our climate changes on land? What is the role of Argo on land? So uh, thank you for this question. So I started to mention this a bit. So again, uh, through the... Um, to the uh, unprecedented invention of Argo, uh, there are much more data available, not only to validate a model, but also there are these systems, so-called reanalysis systems, where you combine the model with the observations. Um, and so with all these measurements in a 3D version, or even 4D, if you add the time, <laughs> Uh, there was really a significant improvement of those systems. And those systems are the baseline in order to develop forecasting systems. So also those forecasting systems have improved. And with the more and more Argo floats, and also with the addition of other variables, we are also able to extend and improve these forecasts also for the biogeochemical bio aspects and also for biodiversity aspects, marine ecosystems. And also to start to downscale these forecasting mechanisms, also to go into the aspects of forecasting for extremes, marine extremes or impacts also from the combination of marine extremes with uh, atmospheric extremes like uh, storm surges and, and then sea level extremes, etc. So these are the major aspects and uh, particular then to moving then more interface ocean land, with respect to your questions, uh, to help uh, also building up realable forecasting systems for the world, uh, which are much needed in the times where everybody is in a change, in changing manner with uh, more frequency and intensity of extremes, for example, and the slow emergent change where we need to prepare, where we need to have information ready, observations combined with our uh, modeling skills to also prepare adaptation, long-term adaptation strategies for these long, lo slow emerging changes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Etzen from Wood Solar Oceanographic. I have got a related question to you. Um, it would be wonderful if during, say, the, your GO ship uh, cruises, you also were measuring atmospheric boundary layer measurements. Uh, that is, launching balloons, say, like they do, twice a day, every day, over land. Uh -huh. That would be so much value added, I would say, to the marine meteorological community. We'd love to see it. Is that? That sounds totally possible. Just send an email. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll also have to send the balloons. We, don't, we can't fund them. <laughs> so um, I think that actually, well, um, we've added deploying. Um, I, I do both ghost ship and BGC Argo. So. Um, <laughs> Adding these floats to Go Ship has been a real kick, a real fun thing, uh, because we usually have a school that's adopted it. And so the group that's out there gets to you know, contact with the school and write their name and do, draw pictures all over the float and launch it for the school. Um, and it's just added more interest to the tedious days of taking samples four times a day and running them into the lab and you know, going through your 12-hour shift of running pH or whatever. Um, so I think launching balloons would be great. Smiley faces. <laughs> With smiley faces, yeah. <laughs> and, and in addition, I would just quickly add is also that we uh, also, there's a big call also to have more information, not only on the atmospheric aspect, but also on the exchange between the ocean and, and uh, the atmosphere through the flux, fluxes of carbon to know where and how much uh, the exchange is taking place, if our carbon sink is, is changing or not, and the same also for heat. And, and if I could, th I, that was going to be part B, is directly measuring the exchange of CO2 between the ocean and atmosphere would be wonderful. And they are working on systems that are autonomous enough that they could do that on ships. There are a lot of other. 
Thank you very much. This is Srinivasa from Incois, uh, India. And uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> and thanks for the wonderful presentations, actually. And Incois has uh, started launching some VGC Argo floats in the Indian Ocean. And then with the core Argo, we have had more than two decades of experience now with all this wonderful Argo community. And then we know how the CTD sensors are doing over a long period of time. But then with the BCG, now do we have enough data sets in the past few years to, to see how the, uh, say for example, the oxygen and the pH, these sensors tend to behave, the stability of these sensors or, uh, you know, because we are talking about climate and those kind of measurements. So, yeah. just That's a question there. for Ken. <laughs> did you hear it? Yes, I did. I, I, I heard, and that's a great question. And I, I'll just make the point that we put an awful lot of effort into validating the measurements and, and publishing those results. I, and I would point you a paper I wrote in 2017 on sensor performance, a paper Tanya Maurer wrote in 2021 on the data system and sensor performance. And, and the take home message, I will say. Um, so the sensors are pretty good. They are not as good as um, the ghost ship measurements. You know, that's the baseline. But they're pretty close, and they're there all year round. So, um, you know, uh, we would say that oxygen, as an example, is good to 1% of the value. Um, I think a ghost ship oxygen is probably good to about 2 tenths of a percent. But... I've got oxygen every, every 10 days, all year round, and that just you know changes things. So, um, you, you know, uh, it's pretty good, it's not perfect. And there are a lot of papers that will lay out the statistics and, uh, of that. Oh, hi, um, I'm uh, Rob Monroe, I'm from Scripps Oceanography, and I have kind of a layman's question. Uh, Lynn, you mentioned that there's been sort of a drop off in data from uh, uh, core Argo, but sort of a, a, a uh, concurrent rise in data collection from BGC Argo and Deep Argo. Um, is there has there been like a net loss or net gain of data? I mean, is the are the BGC and Deep Argo uh, collections uh, keeping pace with the sort of the drop off of? I guess Ken could take the that core too. Well, either one of us could take that. Um, the drop-off is, um, I'm going to say, is, is largely due to inflation. <laughs> so um, so the, the um, core Argo is fully funded by NOAA, um, and uh, it's been in place for a long time. And so it's, it's a very, very important part of the OAR portfolio. Um, there is a fixed budget, and so this is a concern. So, you know, it's a discussion. Um, the BGC and DEEP are both experimental, so um, expansion isn't guaranteed and continuation isn't guaranteed. And so this is a very active discussion, you know, how we uh, may find sources of revenue, uh, sources of funding uh, to really go completely global. Um, in, for each of these observing systems, the concept is about half of it is U.S. and half is international, and that is more or less how they're building, how they're built out. And just to like summarize the answer to your question, so there has been a net loss in recent years um, due to the inflation and other factors. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, I'm, I'm Torsten Kiefer from JPI Oceans. And um, exactly on that point, so if you had to, to, make, to do a trade-off between um, sustaining the level of core Argo or, or expanding uh, deep Argo and, and, and and biogeochemical, um, let's say, in, in a world of not unlimited resources. <laughs> uh, so would you do it, or what would be the strategy there? <laughs> so before I pass this off to Lynn, um, I'm going to say I think you'll probably get different answers from different panelists based on what we're studying. And with that, caveat. <laughs> I'd say, what does a satellite cost? I mean, just consider. Um, here we're talking about, okay, sort of 20 million a year for the U.S. core Argo. It is about 20 for the BGC and 20 for the deep. They are more expensive. Um, uh, so you're talking about tripling, which is not going to, it won't happen in a budget that's so just sitting there. Um, it has to be really expanded. Um, but if you think of what it costs to put a satellite up and that this is the information that matches what the satellite is measuring. 
Um, and so, um, yes, you get the top millimeter. What do you, what's happening 100 meters below, 1,000 meters below, we don't know without a system like this. And I think that the um, promise, the opportunity to be able to look at carbon and oxygen and um, chlorophyll, some measure of plankton, um, backscatter, I look at the ecosystems to the, down to 2,000 meters is just too, too painful to imagine that we, we have the technology, we have the capability to do this. It's just a matter of money. Um, how do we prioritize? We don't prioritize between those three. Obviously, we keep TNS going forever. Um, but <laughs> you do want to know where the carbon's going and coming from. Ken Linsa, do you want to add anything to that? You know, so it's, it's a terrible question. I mean, it's an <laughs> honest question, but, but um, very tough. I, you know, so the core Argo is the best thing that has happened in oceanography. It is phenomenal. We need to know where the heat is going. That drives everything else. And I have said that, I'm, so I'm the BGC guy, right? But if, the mon if there weren't money there, we would have to keep core going. That's the fundamental, that's the base for everything that, that we're talking about. Um, sad, sad but true. So, but, you know, it's, it's crazy. It, 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 as Lynn said, you know, the 20 million a year for each one of these programs, it's about the cost of running a, a very large research vessel each year uh, in the U.S. Uh, a, a global class ship is 15, 18 million a year. So, I mean, there, it's not a crazy number but it's a hard number to find. Yeah. Thank you, guys. We have time for one last question. Do we have any young? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for the presentations. My name is Kathleen, and I'm from Ruma Foundation. The numbers I heard earlier with one Argo was that you have 400 floats with a target of 4,000. No, was that 4, right? Uh, one Argo. Lynn, Lynn. There are 4,000. There are 4,000 floats now. Yeah. I, I was curious, being from Southeast Asia, whether you have any floats around there and also where is a wish list of places you would like to put more floats? Anywhere there's a hole. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we are, um, uh, uh, Ken and I are very, very involved in the BGC Argo. Um, I, I look for ships. I set up the deployments. Um, he builds floats and sensors and so forth. Um, make sure that they're working. Um, so we're always looking for opportunities to deploy. Um, we have to worry about EEZs, um, deploying in EEZs, but then we go for permissions. Um, uh, and then if floats go into EEZs, that's fine, according to, there, there are international agreements that allow that. And also it depends oh. also on the question you asked for. With respect, for example, for the heat, um, there had been gaps highlighted, such as Deep Argo, and so luckily we start to, to explore deeper ocean. But there are also other gaps like the polar areas. Also here there are new technical developments because of challenging under ice. Uh, but uh, for example, the Arctic area is a uh, climate change amplification and also a center for feedback mechanisms. So that would be another key area also like uh, the Southern Ocean known from Paleo history that this was also the launching area if there is any big turning point in Earth's climate and also the shallow areas, right? Again, to come back to the improvements of more regional uh, forecasting systems and also uh, early development, uh, early warning systems uh, so that you have more data also in those areas. Um, so that's time for us, but we'd like to thank everyone for coming and Dr. Morgan for giving the opening remarks there. And I presume the panelists will hang around if you have more questions that we didn't get to. So thank you. And there's Lynn's Legos. Come say hi.